Latoya Katrina Hill was eight years old when she went missing from Baltimore, Maryland on March 24, 1982. She lived at the Lafayette Homes, a public housing project in the 200 block of South Spring Street. She came home from school and her mother, Annette Stanley, gave her a snack and permission to play outside. While she was away, Toya left to walk two blocks to a store at the corner of Ghost Street and South Carolina Street. She was never supposed to walk to the store by herself. However, she wanted some candy and told her sister she was going even though she wasn't supposed to. According to reports, on March 24, 1982, Toya was spotted at the store speaking with two men, one who happened to be her mother's ex-boyfriend. After going to the store, she has never been seen or heard from again. Eventually, the ex-boyfriend and the other man who saw Toya at the store were questioned, but they both insisted they didn't know where Toya was and had nothing to do with her disappearance. Both men were eventually cleared as suspects in the case. Toya was described as a quiet, well-behaved child, and this was the first time she had ever disobeyed her mother's orders. When Annette arrived back home at 7.30 p.m., she discovered her daughter was missing. Annette was set to get married three days after Toya's disappearance, and she believed her ex-boyfriend had possibly kidnapped her in an effort to keep her from marrying her new boyfriend. She asked him multiple times about Toya, but he always claimed he didn't know where she was. Annette said she went ahead with her wedding on schedule because she thought her ex-boyfriend might eventually give Toya back. However, that didn't happen and she would eventually get divorced and marry the ex-boyfriend because she still believed he had something to do with Toya's disappearance. After the two were married, no new information about Toya surfaced, so she left him several months later. He has since reportedly passed away, and if he did have any information on Toya's disappearance, there would be little hope in finding that out now. There is still little information available in Toya's case, but foul play is suspected, and as of today, her case remains unsolved. Twenty-five-year-old Miko Loxley was found with a single gunshot wound to the chest in the 5500 block of Harper's Farm Road in Columbia, Maryland around 10.20 p.m. on September 3, 2017. On the night of his death, a person in the area heard a gunshot and would find Miko shot and bleeding. He was rushed to the University of Maryland Shock Trauma Center where he was pronounced dead. Police suspect Miko was targeted and they don't know at this time if the motive was drug related or some sort of dispute. Miko previously played football for the University of New Mexico and then Lackawanna College in Pennsylvania. He was working at a subway store just minutes away from where he was killed. Miko was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder at the age of 22 when he was a senior at Tosin. His diagnosis caused hallucinations and symptoms of a mood disorder, such as depression or mania, but could be controlled by medication. His parents state that when Miko took his medication as prescribed, he was better. Mike Loxley, the victim's father, was coaching at the University of Alabama at the time of his son's murder. The last time Mike spoke with his son Miko, Mike was sitting in the tunnel of the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, waiting as players trickled out of the locker room following Alabama's season opening win over Florida State in September of 2017. After every game, Mike would call and text his four children to discuss the football game. Mike would speak to Miko on the phone, not knowing this would be his last conversation with his son ever. Mike and his wife, Kia, returned to Tuscaloosa around 2 a.m. Sunday morning. He would get up later and go into the office where Kia would join him to attend a dinner hosted by Alabama head coach Nick Saban and his wife, Terry. After the dinner, around 10 p.m., Mike and Kia would go home and then watch some TV and eventually fall asleep. At around 3 a.m., they heard a knock on their door, and they both got up and rushed to see who it was. Mike looked through the peephole and saw three officers from the University of Alabama Police Department. Kia assumed one of the players from the team had gotten into some trouble, but it never crossed her mind the visit might involve one of her own children. Mike would say he had a different, more sickening feeling when he saw the police officers. It was then that the couple learned about the tragedy of their son. 
Since the tragedy, they have longed for closure and still seek any information that might bring them one step closer. Investigators say they have been looking at every possible motive, including a possible robbery or the result of an ongoing dispute, but as of today, the case remains unsolved. On August 2, 1981, the U.S. Park Police received an anonymous phone call stating that there was a body lying in the grass alongside of the Baltimore-Washington Parkway in Greenbelt, Maryland. Due to his location found, he has become known as the Greenbelt John Doe. The scenic highway where the body was found extends 29 miles, connecting Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, Maryland. The body was wrapped in a blue blanket, similar to a hospital blanket. The young man's ankles and his right foot were wrapped in bandages. The man was wearing blue jeans and near his body was a beige or white medical canvas straitjacket with the letters U.S. on it. The straitjacket found near the body made investigators think he might have been a patient at a local treatment facility. The body was found close to Forest Haven, a live-in facility located in Laurel, Maryland for children and adults with intellectual disabilities. The facility was eventually shut down in 1991 after a lawsuit filed by families of patients and after monitoring by the Department of Justice revealed extensive abuse and problems with the care of its patients. However, Forest Haven was not the only facility nearby. At the time, there was also Spring Grove Mental Hospital, Walter Reed Medical Center, and Crownsville Medical Center. A medical examiner estimated that the John Doe had been dead for several days before being found. He was African American, most likely between the ages 15 and 22 years old, and was very malnourished, weighing only about 106 pounds. The victim had deformed top front teeth. The teeth were very jagged with gaps and appeared severely decayed. One report also noted that he had very long fingernails. In 1981, the Park Police contacted several local hospitals, local and federal law enforcement agencies seeking missing person reports in attempts to identify the victim. They sent fingerprints to the FBI, but nothing matched the unidentified person. In 2011, Park Police Detective Monique Pettit began an investigation into the Greenbelt John Doe and discovered that the body was cremated in 1982. She then found two black and white autopsy photographs, the autopsy report, and a piece of the man's hair. She submitted the hair for DNA testing and uploaded the results into a national DNA database. Detective Pettit has also contacted 52 U.S. states and jurisdictions requesting they search their databases for a match of the John Doe. She has also entered the case into the National Missing and Unidentified Person databases. Many believe that he is James Natalia Foster, who went missing from Steelacoom, Washington in July of 1980. James was born on August 6, 1960, and was 19 years old at the time of his disappearance. However, no definite identification has been made, and as of today, the case remains unsolved. Nancy Marlene Snow went missing in November of 1980. She spoke seven languages, formerly lived in Brazil and West Germany, traveled around the world, and also worked as a talk show host in California. In November of 1980, she lived in Annapolis, Maryland. She had flown back to Maryland from St. Louis, Missouri, where she was temporarily assigned by the Republican National Committee during the Reagan-Bush presidential election campaign. During the election, she was a fundraiser for the campaign to elect Jean McNary for senator. On the evening of November 5, 1980, one day after Ronald Reagan was elected president, she attended a private party in Baltimore. Nancy reportedly spent the night in a hotel in Baltimore after the party was over and had breakfast with the man who hosted the party and whom she had dated during the campaign. The man stated she waited with him in his car until her temporary house sitter picked her up. 
A witness would report that when her house sitter arrived, he was driving a different type of car than Nancy's turquoise VW convertible. He stated that she told him she planned to drive to Connecticut the next day. However, the family could make no sense of this Connecticut detour because they had been told by Nancy by phone the night before and by letters and postcards that she was exhausted after being on the campaign trail for two months and could not wait to get back to her Annapolis apartment and relax and catch up. After getting in the vehicle with her house sitter, she was never seen again. Her house sitter, Paul T. Collins III, who goes by Tom, later stated that he drove her to her Annapolis home and she went out to McGarvey's, a local Irish bar, for a drink. When she returned, she said she met a boat captain named Captain J, who told her he was driving to Fort Lauderdale, Florida that night to pick up a yacht and then deliver it to either the Bahamas or U.S. Virgin Islands. Nancy stated Captain Jay had hired her to help crew the boat and she would be back by Christmas. She told Tom to use her checkbook to pay bills while she was gone. Tom claims he saw her get into a white van and leave, but he could not remember the boat's name, any contact information, or what the captain looked like. Her loved ones found Tom's story very suspicious and stated that she was a devoted mother and a very responsible individual who would be unlikely to leave with a stranger without telling her family where she was going. They said she would also never leave her checkbook in the care of a person she did not know. She called or wrote her daughters every day before her disappearance and would have never left town without calling her family to inform them of such a huge decision. She also left behind the majority of her personal belongings, including her boat shoes, makeup, and jewelry. Tom said she only packed one bag and took $1,000 in cash. When she missed her daughter's 16th birthday, family knew something was very wrong. Her oldest daughter reported her as a missing person in January 1981. Nancy was divorced and her daughters lived with their father. Tom wrote checks to himself and for bills using Nancy's checkbook, forging her signature for six months after her disappearance. The total amount was about $10,000. He continued to drive her VW convertible even though he told her family he had put it in storage. It is also reported that he sold all her belongings and all of her files and papers at her home disappeared. After being questioned by the Annapolis police about Nancy's disappearance in October 1981, Tom left the country for the Bahamas in December before he could be questioned by a grand jury. Warrants were issued for his arrest in connection with the thefts. Nancy's disappearance remains unsolved. There has been no activity on her social security number since her disappearance, and she never used her credit cards or withdrew anything from her bank account, although she had inherited a sum of money shortly before her disappearance. She was declared legally dead in 1985, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. George Stanley Burdinsky Jr. was born on July 29, 1982, and went by the name Jr. He was a student at Thomas Stone Elementary School and lived with his parents Barbara and George Burdinsky and his younger sister Virginia. His mother told authorities that he left their home at the 4300 block of 40th Place in Brentwood, Maryland around 3.30 p.m. on May 24, 1993. Ten-year-old George was planning on riding his bike to meet an adult friend, Robert Violet, at his home in the 4500 block of 37th Street. Robert stated that Junior never arrived, but witnesses said that they saw Junior in front of Robert's mother's residence at 4 p.m. Junior was last seen biking around the neighborhood at approximately 8.30 p.m. that evening. He has never been heard from again. 
Junior was riding his small red bicycle that was missing its rear fender and had a spare rim tied around the handlebars at the time of his disappearance. His father and Robert searched for Junior the following morning and discovered the bicycle rim near a tennis court three blocks from the family's residence. There was no sign of Junior at the scene and his bicycle has never been recovered. Junior's disappearance led to the most extensive search in Prince George's County history. While it never located Junior, the investigation did uncover a child sex abuse ring that stunned the community. Police learned that six young boys were molested in a home just two miles from where the Burdinskys lived. The lead in Junior's case involved two suspects who were connected to a child exploitation ring in the mid-Atlantic United States. The FBI discovered that the suspects utilized the internet to further their child pornography ventures. The individuals, homeowner James Kowalski and his renter and co-worker Stephen Leake, occasionally referred to as Bruce Leake, and Joseph Lynch, were never charged in connection with Junior's disappearance. But the FBI did begin an investigation focused on internet child exploitation because of the failed lead. In 1994, the FBI launched the Innocent Images National Initiative, which works to prosecute suspected child pornographers on the web. Junior's mother testified at Lynch's trial, saying that her son visited Lynch's home in the 3200 block of Barnum Street with his friends in 1993. Authorities believe that Kowalski, Leake, and Lynch sexually abused two of Junior's friends the weekend prior to his disappearance. Kowalski stated that he was not aware of Junior's disappearance, but investigators made a chilling discovery that he had videotaped news footage of his case at his home. In addition, there was proof that Junior had logged onto a computer there to play a video game. Junior's parents stated that Kowalski had taken their son on at least two all-day excursions, including a water park, and then returning to his home. Kowalski was the molester of the children while Leek recorded the acts. Nearly 700 pictures were seized from the Hyattsville home, many of them showing young boys. Police also seized 3,200 videotapes. Six weeks before Junior's disappearance, Kowalski moved from Hyattsville, Maryland to Winchester, Virginia, where investigators discovered sexually explicit diaries. At the time, in 1993, a police spokeswoman told the media, One piece of information that we don't mind sharing that we have obtained from the floppy disks is some detailed accounts of his visits to Costa Rica and the little boys that he encountered there and what he did with them. What did he do with them? Um, Paid them for sex. Numbers of them. The three men were eventually convicted of child abuse unrelated to Junior's case. Kowalski and Leek are still incarcerated, but Lynch has been released. Police say the two men befriended young boys, gave them gifts, and invited them into their home. Then they sexually abused them, often videotaping the criminal acts. Kowalski is currently serving more than 200 years in prison. Over the years, investigators checked out hundreds of leads. Among them, the discovery of what appeared to be a shallow grave in a Cottage City neighborhood park about a mile from the Burdisky home, but Junior's body wasn't there. Investigators announced in March 2002 that they were focusing on another individual whom they believe may have murdered Junior in 1993. Authorities have not publicly named the suspect as the case is still under investigation. The information received by investigators reportedly does not involve any of the convicted child molesters. In June 1993, a Brentwood woman was charged with lying to investigators about the last time she saw Junior. Gloria Pettit was a neighbor of Junior's and was a lifelong friend of Jane's Kowalski. Detective James White, a police spokesman, said that timing is critical in helping detectives retrace the hours leading up to Junior's disappearance. Strangely, Kowalski is also accused of molesting Gloria's 9 and 11-year-old sons and another 13-year-old boy in Brentwood. 
Kowalski pleaded guilty to molesting one of Gloria's sons and two of Junior's friends and videotaping the acts. At one point, he faced 84 counts of child abuse and pornography involving six of Junior's friends. Gloria later sued Kowalski, seeking $4 million in damages. Kowalski was also the children's godfather. Junior's parents stated that Gloria often introduced Kowalski to Brentwood residents and their children. Kowalski testified in 1994 that he had an uncontrollable urge to molest children and attempted to declare he was insane, but that claim was rejected by the jury. Kowalski told jurors that he recognized his sexual attraction to boys at an early age and had his first sexual encounter at age 13 with a younger boy. Kowalski was unapologetic in describing his sexual relationships with more than 20 boys, including child prostitutes on trips to Costa Rica and Puerto Rico. In 2004, there were reported sightings of Junior in Boston and Northborough, Massachusetts. Witnesses recognized him by the scar on his face and said he appeared to be homeless. He may have been with a group of people selling magazines or coupon books door to door. Two detectives from Brentwood traveled to Massachusetts to investigate the sightings, but they were unable to locate the individual or determine whether it was Junior. He has never been identified. As of today, this case remains unsolved.